Jeff Bartell come up here, uh, be coming up here, and so um, you didn't bring your Starbucks cup, but um, if he had brought his Starbucks cup, and let's say his Starbucks cup is this tall, and there's coffee up, up to here, is that cup half full or half empty? And the answer is, it depends on if you're pouring or you're drinking. And I don't see why you didn't get that, because uh, you know, I've been to various countries in Eastern Europe just a few times. That doesn't qualify me at all as an expert. I think a lot of people would say Albania, out of all the countries, might be the hardest, darkest, most difficult place to plant a thriving church. Um, you know, half empty. But some people look at that and say, you know, all the darkness does is make the diamond shine brighter. And they end up with things that everybody else gives excuses why they can't have. That's Jeff Bartel. So they spent, you were in Albania t 10 years, 14 years, been, came back, fortunate for us, came back to the States, pastor a church here in the States about eight years ago. And, uh, and bringing with him all the experience and, you know, all, all of the philosophy of ministry. And so we really love him and the Lord. And I, I, want, I want him to be able to bleed over onto us the mission focus opportunity that we had this last week. So, Brother Bartell, come and preach for us. Love you. Well, good morning, church. It's always such a joy and an honor. And Allow me just to thank you on behalf of my family. This church has been near and dear to us for a very, very long time. And um, we, those of us who participated in the Missions Focus Conference, we had such a wonderful time together. And man, I, I was enriched by that experience. And, and if you didn't have the opportunity, man, you're going to want to mark your calendars for next year. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, what it did for many of us is, is that it motivated us to do what I want to share with you this morning. And so the title I've given today's message is Preparing the Next Generation. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them to 2 Kings chapter number 2. And uh, we're going to be reading the second half of that chapter in just a second. But while you're opening to 2 Kings chapter number 2, let me just say to you uh, a word about the country of Albania. Because when I arrived in Albania in 1992, uh, it, it, the country had just opened from communism, and, and it was the only legislated in the Constitution, it was the only country in all of Eastern Europe that was legislated to be an atheist country. It was against the law to believe in any God. And so after, when I arrived in 1992, the country had just opened, there were no Christians, no Christians. There were no churches. Uh, there was no Bible. They had 45 years of communism, and 25 of those like I said, were legislated atheism. So what happened in Albania over that time is literally in one generation, they had successfully stamped out biblical uh, Christianity. Now, that's something that didn't happen in Russia. Uh, that's something that didn't happen in Poland or Czechoslovakia or Bulgaria or Romania. There was an underground church with underground Christians who had copies of the scriptures, but that didn't happen in Albania. Literally, the devil was able to wipe out biblical Christianity in just one generation. Why is that? Why is that even possible? And I propose to you today that there's only one reason. It's because there was no successful discipleship going on prior to that time. So we're going to talk about preparing the next generation. And, and what I did is I took this study as our church went through a study of the life of of Elijah, and, and the end of chapter number two that we're going to look at is actually about Elisha, of course, who is the successor to Elijah, and, and, the, and when we looked at the life of Elijah, and I'm going to make reference to the first 11 verses, which the first 11 verses of 2 Kings, in summary, is the story of Elijah's rapture, that miraculous chariots of fire coming down and, and taking him out of this world, and then the mantle being passed on to Elisha. Uh, Elijah finishes his ministry strong, and, and then it is passed off to his successor, Elisha. And I find this to be very significant. I find this to be critically important in our understanding, as Elisha is now going to be deemed the next prominent prophet in all of Israel. 
And I would argue that probably the greatest thing that Elijah was ever a part of was preparing his successor so that that person could go on and continue to carry the torch. In other words, I would like for us to consider that it is possible to stand longer than your legs can hold you up. In other words, let's stand for the Lord. And we're going to stand for the Lord in what the Bible calls perilous times, these last days before the coming of the Lord. But, you know, your legs can only hold you up for so long. But if you successfully understand how you can prepare the next generation, then you can pass the baton off to that generation. And church, you know that now, more than ever before, we need to stand. I mean, these are evil days that we live in, and, and we need to continue to stand. And so I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for your pastor and leadership. I'm thankful for the vision that you have in front of you. And we need to stand and do all we can do, but we need to be preparing those that will come after us so that we don't experience what Albania experienced. Because it only takes one generation for it all to stop if we don't do the job that we have to do. So have you found 2 Kings chapter 2? The fir again, Elijah is raptured out in verse number 11. It's that miraculous story, and we're going to pick it up right after that in verse number 12. Please follow along. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they said unto him, Behold, now there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master, lest peradventure the Spirit of the Lord hath taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, Ye shall not send. And when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Send. And they sent therefore fifty men but, and sought three days, but found him not. And when they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said unto them, Did I not say unto you, Go not? And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein, and they brought it to him. And he went forth under the springs of water, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. And he went up from thence unto Bethel. And as he was going by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. I know you can't wait till we get to that part. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. And he went from thence to Mount Carmel and from thence he returned to Samaria. Let's pray briefly that the Lord would just bless our understanding of this passage. And Heavenly Father, we do ask that in this passage that contains some things that we don't normally see, that you would focus our hearts and attentions so that we can actually learn from this story how we can also prepare the next generation and how that generation can outlast and have even more fruit for your glory because you are worthy. Lord, take this time and use it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The question is, how can we get this done? And so the first point that I'd like for us to see, how do we prepare these, these next disciples? Well, we need to test their current ministry. And so I'm going to make some references from the first 11 verses because Elisha had been following Elijah since earlier on. And if you took the time to go back to 1 Kings 19, you would see when Elijah had come and he had called Elisha, he was plowing with oxen and he left the plows and all of that and the oxen and he went to follow Elijah. And so he served Elijah. He was probably a very good personal helper to him. And Elijah knew that if Elisha was really going to be able to take over his ministry, he needed to be tested in certain areas. You know that's true. And so specifically, the first test was a test of his determination, 
a test of his determination. And if we go back earlier in this chapter in verses 2 and, and verse number 4 and verse number 6, three different times we see that Elijah tells Elisha, hey, I need to go up to this place. Tarry here. You stay here. I've got to go on by myself. And Elisha says, no way, I'm going with you. And then, so that was Bethel. And then he goes to Jericho and he says the same thing. You stay here, I've got to go to Jericho. And Elisha says, nothing doing, I'm going with you. And then ultimately he goes to Jordan. He says, you tarry here, I've got to go to Jordan. He says, nothing doing, I'm going with you. Now the interesting thing to me when I read that is, do you think that Elisha was disobedient? I don't. See, I think that Elijah was doing that intentionally as a test. Because when Elisha says, no way, Jose, I'm going with you. What does Elijah do? Does he say, no, listen, you need to listen to me. Remember, I'm the boss. I said stay and you need to stay. No, he doesn't do that. He, say, he resists one time and he says, okay, come on. And after he does that three times, what do we find? Well, listen, what we're seeing is, is his will, his determination to stick with it is being proven. And that's an important thing. Because what the Lord wants to know about each and every one of us is, what will it take? To make you quit. I want you to consider that because your master, even the Lord Jesus Christ, will test you to determine whether or not you will continue to follow him or not. In John chapter 6, Jesus is giving a discourse and he says some hard things for the people who heard him when he talked about how my disciples, they're going to be people who will eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now that was all spiritualized and clarified at this point as he was given the discourse, but the disciples were a little confused. And so he gets to the point in verse number 66 of John chapter 6, and it says this, that from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You see, it was just too weird following Jesus at this point, and they said, I'm out. So what does Jesus do? Verse 67, Jesus said unto the twelve, will ye also go away? You see, kind of like Elijah did with Elisha, he said, this is an important thing. He turns to his most faithful disciples and he says, hey, they're, they're quitting. You want to quit too? Well, Simon Peter had the right answer. I mean, he gets a bad rap, but Simon Peter was okay. Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Good answer, Peter. It's a good answer. Because this is a test of your will. This is a, a test of your determination and your seriousness. You see, this is a time when a leader looks to his disciples, and what he does is he offers him an out. Uh, he, he gives that person a way out. And that's what good leaders will do. Uh, they're going to watch and see who's getting serious. And they're going to test them to see if they'll refuse it. They're going to give you opportunities to say, you know, we got a lot going on, and if you're just tired, you can go on home. Well, you need to realize that sometimes maybe they're just testing you to see whether you'll say, you know, I am tired, thanks. Uh, but listen, when you find somebody who won't take the out, you found somebody. You've got a winner. You remember the story of Gideon and his 300? And they were going to go to war against the Midianites in Judges chapter 7. And they had 32,000 men, which still really weren't enough, but, you know, 32,000 men. I mean, that's a good-sized city, right? Well, what happened? Well, ultimately, God says, you know, Gideon, you have too many people. So he tells them in Judges chapter 7, go to the people and say, whoever is fearful, whoever is afraid, you know, let them go home. Hey, you guys a little bit afraid about this battle? Just, just forget it. Just go home. And 22,000 of them went home. God ultimately says, okay, you got 10,000. That's still not really enough. And he provides another test. But isn't that interesting? He says, give them an out. See who will walk away. So what did God ultimately do? He won the battle with just 300. Why is that? Because it had nothing to do with the 300. It had everything to do with what the Lord was doing. And he's testing your determination. He's testing to see whether you will quit. And so Elijah offers him an out, and he's the first plot time, you know, he's going to Bethel. Well, you know what Bethel means, right? It's the house of God. Isn't it interesting how sometimes people just can't seem to remain faithful to the house of God? And maybe something comes up. Maybe it's New Year's Day. You know, maybe things are happening, and you say, well, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think I'm just going to relax a little bit. Uh, the next place he goes is to Jericho when he offers them the out. Well, you know what that word Jericho really means if you were to translate it? It's the place of fragrance. A place of fragrance, that's kind of like incense. That's kind of like the prayers of God's people, isn't it? 
I mean, how many times do you get weary and well-doing and, you know, the church has a prayer meeting and you say, well, you know, I, I think I'm just going to sit this one out. Okay, well, somebody's watching. Uh, the last place they go is to Jordan. And the Jordan River represents a separation, right? It separates the land of the Gentiles from the land of the Jews. It's a place where John the Baptist baptized to, when people would confess their sins and separate themselves. The Lord Jesus himself was baptized in the Jordan to separate himself to his public ministry. And it's interesting how these things play out in our lives, that things are offered to us and we have the opportunity to decide. You remember the story of Ruth and Naomi, and, and, and they went into Moab, and, and Ruth is a Moabitess and married Naomi's son, and, and the sons died, and Naomi's going back to Bethlehem, and the two daughters-in-law were going to follow her, and she turns to the two daughters-in-law, and she says, hey, why don't you all go back home? I don't have any more sons for you, and just, just go back to Moab. I'm going to go home to Israel. And, and one of them, Orpah, says, okay, I'm going back, but not Ruth. And it's that famous passage, right, in Ruth chapter 1, where Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And where thou diest, I will die. You know, that's the attitude God's looking for. And that's what Elijah does with Elisha. He had the right attitude. And he proved that he was faithful to the end of his current ministry assignment. So here's the question. Can you be faithful in another man's ministry? Can you be faithful in another man's ministry? Uh, this is something that the Lord Jesus proposed to us in Luke chapter 16, where he says, he that, in verse 10, and he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in, the, in much. And, and we know the reference immediately was to financial issues, as it goes on and says in verse 11, if therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, money, financial issues, who will commit to your trust true riches, spiritual riches, eternal riches? And then it goes on in verse number 12. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Listen, I've been a leader in ministry for a long, long time, but, you know, I was also a follower in ministry for a good long time. And I'm going to tell you, as a leader in ministry, there's a lot of guys who come up. The Bible refers to them as young men in the faith. And, and they're enthusiastic, and they're strong, and they're learning the Word of God, and, and they're on fire, and, and they want to go conquer the devil and do things. And before you know it, they're kind of like teenagers. They, you know, they, they're, they know some stuff, but they think they know more than you know, and they want to run out ahead and and they're just frustrated because you haven't given them their own thing soon enough. Well, what God wants to know is, are you able to be faithful in another man's ministry to prove yourself able to eventually have your own? This is what the Lord does. This is what happened with Elisha. Well, there's a couple other tests because the next test is what I'm going to call the test of, their bold, of his boldness. Because if you go back and you look like in verse number 9 and Elisha just sticks with him all the way to the end and Elijah turns to Elisha in verse 9 and he says, all right, if you end up going with me across Jordan, what is it exactly you want me to do for you? And you know, if Elisha was just kind of a humble church member like a lot of us, you know, he might have just said, well, you know, just whatever you think is okay. <laughs> he didn't do that, did he? In verse number 9 he said, I want your job and I want to do it better. That's what he said. Amen. I want a double portion of your spirit. And, and what is it that Elijah said? He says, boy, that's, that's a hard thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Listen, that was a bold move, wouldn't you say? I mean, what he's asking for is God's power on his life. And you know the Lord wants us to be bold with him. You know that in Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know the testimony of Peter and John after the day of Pentecost and they go out preaching and these aren't highly educated guys. These are commercial fishermen, you know. And so in Acts 4.13, what's the big testimony? When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them. Why? Because they'd been with Jesus. Because that's what happens when you spend time with the Lord. And Elisha is demonstrating these things, proving his determination, and proving his boldness. Listen, you need to, you need to be bold these days. 
I mean, these are tough days we live in because there's a war out there. And if you'll engage in the battle for the Lord, I mean, there's, there's no place to be timid. You can't just be timid. The last thing is, is that he, tested his fo he tests his focus. Because what does he say to him? He says, okay, verse number 10, you asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I'm taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. So Elisha knows I have to vis visibly see Elijah be taken out. So where do you suppose Elisha's focus was? I guarantee his eyes were up. He's looking for the chariot and he's wanting to not miss this event. If he was down tying his shoe when that thing happened, it's over. It's done, right? If he was like the five foolish virgins who didn't bring oil for their lamp and had to go get some, they missed it. He had to have his focus from above in order to receive the blessing. And that's what it says in James chapter 1 and verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift, where? Is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Colossians 3, you know this is true. Colossians 3, if you be then uh, risen with Christ, seek those things where? That are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So he was tested. And he passed the test. Well, once your ministry has been tested and you've passed, then what you can expect is to multiply your ministry. And that's what we see in the life of Elisha. And I wish we had time to get into it all, but you know some things, right? All the way back from the very beginning of creation, all through the book of Genesis, God made it very clear that his goal for his children was to have a multiplied ministry. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He said to Adam, he said it to Noah, he said it to Abraham, he said it to Jacob. It was the testimony of the nation of Israel at the beginning of the book of Exodus. It was always about be fruitful and multiply. Well, multiply means more than you used to have, right? It's pretty simple. So if that's going to happen, multiplication requires a couple of things. First off, to be filled with the Spirit. So he asks for this double portion. But you need to understand, right? You understand the Bible when it's not possible that you can get more of the Spirit. Amen? I mean, there's some groups out there that'll tell you that that's the case, but that's just not biblically true. The Bible says very clearly in John 3, 34, that God does not give his Spirit unto us by measure. He doesn't give you a little here and a little more there. That's not how it works. Either you have the Spirit of God or you don't. And so in Romans 8 and verse number 9, God makes it very clear. If you don't have the Spirit of God, well, you're not really saved. You're none of His. Either when you were born again, you got all of God there is. But that's not the way it always was in the Old Testament. Remember Psalm 51 and David's praying that prayer of repentance after his sin with Bathsheba. And he prays to the Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Because in an Old Testament context, well, the Holy Spirit came and he could leave again like he did from Saul, like he did from Samson. It was possible. Now, David had sure mercies and the Spirit did not leave him. But in the New Testament, that's not even an option for us. Praise the Lord. He indwells us permanently. And in Ephesians 1 and in Ephesians 4, it talks about how we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, the earnest of our inheritance until the day of that redemption of the purchased possession. Man, we have this and it is permanent. So the issue for our application, what is this idea then about understanding a double portion? Well, it's not how much of the Holy Spirit do you have, but how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? That's the issue, right? Because the more of you the Holy Spirit has, well, the more He will use you. So literally in the context, a double portion means that Elisha's ministry lasted double the amount of time and that he performed double the amount of miracles. And you can take your time and you can go and check that out, but his ministry lasted twice as long. And literally, Elijah has five recorded miracles in Elijah's life. Elisha has ten recorded miracles in his life and ministry. He got the double portion. Very simply, what does that mean for you? Well, very simply, it means that a tested, faithful, disciple 
can expect a multiplied ministry. Amen? I mean, that's good stuff. Amen. Multiplication requires that you be filled with God's Spirit. And multiplication also requires beginning a new ministry. So I'm thrilled to hear how your church has a vision to start new churches. And in the Missions Focus, we prayed over three new churches from our fellowship. And, and our church, my, my youth pastor was with us this week, and, and he texted me on his way to the airport yesterday, and he said, he said, Pastor Jeff, we have got to do this. We've got to start new churches. And, and, and I said, well, you know, I've been saying that. But okay, it's a good idea. I'm glad you thought of it, you know. And so, man, we got to have new, that's how it's going to multiply, not just, you know, stuffing us all in here. I mean, okay, more people, but man, we got to multiply the ministry. So, you know, we could spend, uh, you know, a whole LFBI class talking about what do you do to do that? How do you do that? Well, very quickly from this story, we can glean this. What do you do when you first start out on your own? Well, you know what you do? You just retrace the steps of what you did when you were still the other guy's assistant. I mean, you continue to do what you have been trained to do. So literally, what were the last steps of Elijah? He went to Bethel, he went to Jericho, he went to Jordan. What were the first steps of Elisha? He went to Jordan, he went to Jericho, he went to Bethel. What's the first miracle that Elisha does? He takes the mantle, was the last one of Elijah, parts the Jordan, takes the mantle, where's the Lord God of Elijah? Parts the Jordan. You do the same thing you learned doing when you were faithful in another man's ministry. That's what you do because you're just multiplying it. You retrace the steps. So when he went to Jordan, he parts the waters. That's what he does. He's separate. Now Elisha is separated under the public ministry of the prophet. And Elisha's first miracle establishes his authority. So there's these sons of the prophets and they're kind of in the area and they're watching this whole thing go down. And when they see this happen and Elijah goes up and Elisha takes the thing and he parts the waters, the sons of the prophets come and they say, wow, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. He sets himself apart. Oh, isn't that what Jordan's all about? Separating yourself. He sets himself apart as Elijah's replacement to his personal ministry. That's what happens. And so he says, hey, there's 50 of us. We're here for you now. So when God takes a man who's been proven and he sets him out in a new ministry, what's he going to do? He's going to give him faithful followers as well. So Elisha's starting out. He's got 50 guys with him that are willing to do some stuff. Now in our story, they had a dumb idea. And he said, don't do it. And they said, eh, let us do it. I, no, don't do it. No, let us do it. All right. And they went and looked for Elijah. Maybe God dumped him on a mountain somewhere. Did you find him? No. Well, I told you. Well, I mean, that happens, right? I mean, enthusiastic young guys will come, hey, hey preacher, uh, let me do this. Uh, don't do that. Let me do this. Don't do that. All uh, right, go do it. Uh, that didn't work. Well, I tried to tell you. That's all just part of the process. It's okay. Well, his second stop is Jericho. What does he do there? He heals the waters. So the waters were terrible, and there was death and barrenness, and so he gets the salt, and he pours it in, his second public ministry uh, miracle, and he heals the waters. So at the result, the last phrase is, there was no more death or barren land. No more death? Oh, well, what that means is, it brings life. Elijah's second miracle produces life and fruit. No more death, now there's life. No more barrenness, now there's fruit. What is your new ministry supposed to be all about? It's supposed to be about evangelism and discipleship. That is the Great Commission. That's all we have. That's all we need, right? I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's how you start a new ministry. I remember when I was going to Albania for the first time, and my pastor at that time, I mean, I was the uh, junior high Sunday school class director, and, you know, and, and I said, wow, I, I've never started a church. I've, I've never done this. I don't, I don't really know what to do. And my pastor said something that I, I tried to find fault in it, couldn't seem to find fault in it. I wish I could if I couldn't. He said, well, man, you got a Bible. You know how to lead people to the Lord. You know how to make disciples. Just go do that. That'll keep you busy for a while. And I sat there and I thought, man, I, there's got to be a reason why that's not a good answer. But that was the right answer. You got a Bible. 
You know how to lead people to the Lord? You know how to make disciples? Just go do that. That ought to keep you busy for a while. Listen, the third stop that he makes, he's on his way to Bethel, and I just call this stirring the waters. When he goes to Bethel, he's on the way, and then he meets these little children. A crazy story. Go up, thou bald head. Okay? The she-bears come and maul these children. You think, man, what a crazy story that is, right? Well, listen, let me just say this about that, because we learned, right, that he establishes his authority. He begins to have life and fruit. What's the next thing that's encountered? When he gets his authority, he's separated to the ministry, he gets some followers, people are getting saved and getting discipled. What's the next thing that's going to happen in your ministry? People are going to come and mock you. They're going to mock you. So there's no miracle on the way to Bethel, right? Just mocking. And okay, the circumstances are strange. But you need to understand that mocking is a tactic of the devil. Do you remember the story of Nehemiah? And they go back after the captivity and they're wanting to rebuild the walls. Well, what is that effectively? Effectively, they are wanting to expand. They're going to reestablish the borders and the city of Jerusalem and of Israel. They are going to multiply back again the influence of God's people Israel after 70 plus years of captivity. I mean, this is the multiplied ministry. And what happens when they are there and they are beginning to build in Nehemiah chapter 4? There's some guys that come up. They heard they were building. They said, hey, we got to stop this. And they began to mock them. And they began to make fun of them. And they said, man, if a little fox runs across this wall, this feeble wall you're building, that thing's going to fall down. And they tried to discourage them in the work. But it didn't work. They ultimately finished the work that they went to do. This is a tactic of the devil to fight against the work of the Lord. Amen. Now, you want to know a little bit more about these kids and the bald head thing. So let me just say this about it. They came and they were mocking him in the sense that, Eli go up, thou, go up. They, they know Elijah just went up. Hey man, hey, hey. Hey, monkey boy, do a trick for me. Hey, hey, circus clown, Elijah did something cool. You do something cool. Go up like he went up. And thou bald head, you know, uh, guys, you know, this isn't what you might think it is. Uh, the idea is in the Old Testament that, that this baldness was the idea of, of having to have your head shaved because of leprosy or something. It was an idea of shame. It was the idea of some result that came from, from sin and disease. And so the idea was that they're mocking him like, you're nothing like Elijah. You can't do what he did, and, and, and you're like a leper. I mean, that's, how, that's what this was all about. And so what does he do? He turns and he curses them. And the Bible says that the curse causeless shall not come. There's a reason. Now, within the context here, there's all kind of beautiful pictures of the end times and the tribulation and all those sort of things. But, but literally, I just want you to get the idea. And let me, by the way, let me just say to you, because I know that especially, you know, moms, I mean, it, it tugs on your heart. Man, little children. You know, I get it. But let me just tell you something. In the real world, little children don't come up with this crazy, devilish, mocking stuff all on their own without having been prompted and provoked Amen. by some cowardly adults. Yeah. Let me just tell you. They will send the children to do their bidding. And I, I have a funny sensation that that's probably really what was going on here anyway. So with that in mind, literally, let me just give you a quick summary. I want to do one last thing, and that is to summarize their ministries. And this will only take a minute. Because when I look at the lives, the reason, one of the reasons I took on this study in our church of Elijah and Elisha is I believe it's a beautiful picture of discipleship. And you have two kinds of ministers or two kinds of ministries. And one of them is uh, a, what I'll call a trailblazer, and I'll call the other one a trail paver. Okay, one is a pioneer that cuts down all the weeds to put a path in the woods somewhere. And the other one goes down that path and begins to, you know, to lay some asphalt so you can get higher traffic up and down the path, right? So Elijah's the pioneer. Elijah learns from the school of hard knocks. I mean, Elijah's the one who's starving by the brook Cherith and is fed by the ravens and all that sort of thing. Usually requires a lot of personal brokenness. You learn your lessons directly from the Lord. But Elisha was his successor. So Elisha learns from the school of Elijah's hard knocks. And what happens? Well, he has more of a multiplied ministry. 
right? He could see the ministry modeled, and he could compare and contrast, and he could benefit from that. So the ministry of a pioneer, and there's needs for both, by the way. The ministry of a pioneer is harder, but they typically get more credit. People remember them. They, they quote them. The guy who comes after the pioneer, well, he maybe doesn't get the recognition publicly, but boy, he's got more fruit. He's got more fruit. And let me just give for your consideration some examples of some other ministry pairs. Moses and Joshua. Who do you remember more? Moses. Who had more success? Joshua. Uh, David and Solomon. Who do you remember more? David. Who had more success in a profitable, expanded king? Solomon. How about this one throw you a curve? Jesus and the apostles. Well, wait a minute. Well, wait a minute. How about John chapter 14 and verse 12 where Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Nobody does greater works than Jesus in scope, but, it, but in quantity all over the world. world the body of Christ is all over the globe when Jesus was focused in Palestine. I could tell you stories about my life in Albania. People, I don't know why, they still really love me there. It's amazing. But the ministry since I've been gone has multiplied and grown. It's a phenomenal thing. It's a, this is an amazing picture. So we're done and we're going to wrap this up. But let me just say this. We need to be about preparing the next generation so that they can stand in the midst of times that are very, very difficult. Yeah. And my question for you is this, as we pray, how are you going to stand? So let's bow our heads and just go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we desperately need you to give us the strength to stand for ourselves and to learn and be prepared and be trained. But Lord, once we begin to learn some things, help us not just to hoard it for ourselves, but help us, Lord, to always be looking to share it and invest it in others. Because God, we don't want to ever see the situation where we're the last generation standing. Lord, let this go on far beyond us. I pray your blessings on Harvest Baptist Church and their fruitfulness until the day you come to call us home. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That was good, wasn't it? Man. I hope you wrote some stuff down so you can recall it. So go ahead and stand and grab your neighbor by the hand. And if you uh, have any spiritual needs, come up here to the front and, and talk with me afterwards. And uh, let me hook you up with somebody who can take their Bible and talk with you. So maybe you need to trust Christ as your Savior today. Start the new year off right. God saves you not through ritual sacraments and ceremonies. He saves you based on your faith in his son's finished work on the cross. He did it all for you, so now he can live inside of you. And if you'll just pray and ask him, say, God, save me for Jesus' sake. And Lord Jesus, I trust you for eternal life. But if you need any spiritual help or assistance, come here to the front. If you're a visitor and I've not met you, you, met you yet, come up here to the front. And uh, we won't have uh, service tonight, so we'll see you Wednesday night back here at the church. Father, again, we thank you today uh, for your love to us. God, we pray that, that uh, Lord, um, what, what is said from this pulpit will never fall on deaf ears. Lord, it doesn't matter who's saying it. Uh, it's all from the Bible, the Word of God. And Lord, we look forward to the start of this new year and looking at how to become a praying church just talking in the first six, eight weeks of this new year, how to become a praying church. Uh, Lord, we've got our Bethel. Uh, help us to move, uh, move on, Lord, to our Jericho so that we can do what you want us to do in crossing the Jordan. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Love you. Have a great week. You're dismissed. <laughs>